Well, thank you very much, Tony. Uh, it's wonderful be, to be back here at Scripps. Um, I, I love what you've done with the place. Uh, I, I have to say, I did get the memo about Hawaiian Shirt Day, but um, having been living out of a suitcase in uh, Houston, working at BP for the last 40 days, I didn't happen to have a Hawaiian shirt with me, so I hope Walter will forgive me for not being in uniform today. Uh, anyway, I, I want to give my uh, congratulations to all the Scripps graduates today. Uh, you have a wonderful lifetime of adventures and um, great ways to contribute ahead of you. And I hope uh, your lifetime will be as exciting and full of wonderful ways to contribute to the world of uh, science and um, the world of uh, adventure as mine has been. And I wish you all the best. Um, Chancellor Fox, uh, reached over and whispered in my ear that I should put you all on a bus and take you back to Houston with me. And uh, <laughs> I wish I could because uh, your nation really needs you. So uh, if you get the call, uh, you'll, you'll know where you're needed. Uh, I also want to give my congratulations to Dudley Chelton on his uh, winning of the Cody Medal. Uh, that's uh, fabulous. And I loved your presentation earlier today. It was. Uh, truly inspirational and uh, learned a lot at it. So thank you very much. And of course, my congratulations as well to Walter Monk on the winning of the Crawford Prize, uh, truly the uh, Nobel Prize in the Earth Sciences. And uh, the only thing we might all ask is, what took them so long? <laughs> so anyway. Um, I'd, I'd love to say that um, I had uh, days to think about my presentation that I was going to give to you all. But um, unfortunately, the way my life has been, um, every day I wonder whether I'm going to be able to have uh, time to get more than five hours of sleep at night, or whether I'm going to be able to eat a meal, or um, you know, have time to uh, uh, get a, a time to even have a phone call to talk to my husband more than once a week. And um, that's just what it's like in um, a crisis. And um, who would have known uh, back at the time that I was at my confirmation hearing uh, to become the, before the Senate, to become, um, to be considered for the directorship of the U.S. Geological Survey, that my life would take this turn. I remember that when I was um, speaking before the Senate, I mentioned that my inspiration to, uh, to come forward and be considered to be the director of the USGS had been my own father. Because in the dark days after the Japanese bombed for Pearl Harbor, he dropped out of Harvard University as a freshman. He lied about his age and waved a heart murmur in order to enlist in the infantry. And after uh, fighting his way to the gates of Berlin, he was, at that time, the youngest commissioned officer in the US Army. And um, I guess at that time, I really didn't think that in taking on government service that oil would become my enemy and that the shores of the Gulf would become my own Normandy. But um, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, the first few months that I was in the uh, USGS, things went sort of smoothly. And the biggest problems I had was, uh, were things like, what am I going to do with my horribly expensive publishing uh, process at the USGS? And that was the kind of problem I was dealing with. And then, after two months, Crises started hitting me like a machine gun. Haiti earthquake, 230,000 lives lost. And then the Chilean earthquake, 8.8 .8 magnitude earthquake. And then Ayafiatlayukat <laughs> shut down air traffic on the busiest corridor on the planet. I had, we were still 
monitoring that as our biggest problem on the planet when flames engulf a platform in the Gulf of Mexico and an underwater geyser erupts a mile deep under the ocean and an environmental disaster starts unfolding before our very eyes and catches everyone totally unaware. And every single one of these disasters falls squarely in the mission of the US Geological Survey. And all of them fall on my plate. So needless to say, my friends at NOAA start calling me the master of disaster. <laughs> so um, what do you do in a situation like this? So what did I do first? Well, the first thing I did was I called upon the people in the USGS who had been involved in the Exxon Valdez disaster and asked them, what were the lessons we had learned from Exxon Valdez? Now, of course, there were important differences in Exxon Valdez. Exxon Valdez was a tanker ship. We knew to the gallon how much oil was in that ship. So it was a much easier disaster to put your arms around. And uh, this one was a mile deep. It was continuing to spew oil out, much less contained. But at least there were things we could learn from Exxon Valdez that were important to um, apply to this. First thing they told me was, get out there before a drop of oil reaches the coastline and document the state of the ecosystem so that you know precisely what was of value and what everything looked like before anything was impacted. So that you know before, you know the during, and you know the aftermath. And don't consider this just a scientific research paper. The level of documentation needed to stand up in court is completely different than the documentation you need to prove to your peers in a scientific journal of what is resolvably different and what is a standard of proof. So that's the first thing we did. We mobilized all hands on deck to go out and get every soil sample, every water sample, every um, count, every animal, everything from the plankton on up to understand what is the state of the system before anything gets impacted. The next thing uh, we learned was that we had to understand cascading impacts. We had to understand how um, that that we couldn't um, balkanize uh, our government response to say, well, NOAA's going to care about the ocean, and Fish and Wildlife is going to care about the land, and um, uh, other people are going to care about, uh, DOE's going to care about how this impacts um, the uh, energy uh, supply, and other people are going to, FEMA's going to care about emergency response, and Coast Guard's going to care about oil spill. We have to understand that this is all one big coupled system. And if we don't work together to understand these cascading impacts, we're all lost. That the animals on land feed off the ocean, and that the economy on land depends on the health of the marine ecosystem. This is all one big cascading effect. We must work together. The next thing uh, we learned from Exxon Valdez is that the impacts and the recovery are long term. We can't think of this in days, weeks, or months. We have to think of it in terms of decades. And in fact, at the very time when the national response might be winding down, at the very time when our national leaders might be saying, mission accomplished is at the very time when the acute impacts are just beginning. And we have to make sure we communicate to our leaders the importance of sticking with it for the long term, because those chronic impacts are sometimes the ones that are hardest to observe 
to anything but the scientific eye. It's that next generation of animals that are coming in that are being impacted and you might wash off a seabird and set it free and think you've done your job but that's kind of like uh, taking a kid who's on crack cocaine and giving him a shower and a haircut and thinking that he's okay. It's not. And um, uh, the next thing I did after uh, putting together all those lessons learned was to set up within the USGS a variety of teams that had to be somewhat um, protected from each other so that they wouldn't interfere with each other in terms of getting their jobs done. The first team was a GIS team that had to meet the needs broadly throughout the government for simply mapping data. They had to be able to see where's the oil, Where's it going using all of the assets um, from satellites, from aircraft, from ground observations, and provide twice daily updates for first responders and uh, to work well um, widely across the government in getting that information out there so that oil could be skimmed, it could be burned, uh, people would know where it was going to impact the shoreline first, and these had to be GIS specialists who recognized the difference between uh, different technologies. Some technologies are very sensitive to thick oil, but don't see the sheen at all. Some technologies are absolutely insensitive to different kinds of oil and might think that um, the oil they're mapping, um, they see all of the oil and a skimmer will go out and realize it's only seeing sheen which can't be skimmed at all. And so they had to understand the difference between them and help the first responders know the difference between it so they aren't wasting time trying to skim oil sheen when they really should be going after the thick oil. So it's getting those GIS specialists out there, getting the right information to the people in the field. So that was the first team that was set up. The next team that was set up was a group of tactical, on-the-ground scientists that could help the people in Fish and Wildlife, um, the National Park Service, the people who were trying to protect the coastline, both in the federal government and the state government, with things like uh, IDing oil. Um, where's this oil from? Is this from uh, this um, uh, oil well, or is it from somewhere else, which was impor important for damage recovery? Um, people who were autopsying animals that died in order to understand what was the cause of death, um, doing very tactical uh, things that were, um, right now, we need to know an answer. But then I also set up uh, a group of scientists that were doing more applied but longer term um, science questions. Things like um, doing LIDAR um, to get very precise mapping um, to the centimeter level of the um, uh, topography right in the near shore area so we could get inundation models for high tides and for hurricanes to know exactly where is oil likely to be carried inland for uh, storm surges so we would know where the areas are that are likely to be impacted. Also understanding things like um, uh, the Louisiana plan to build artificial sand berms, doing studies on that. Is that a good idea? If it's not a good idea, how could it be modified such that it wouldn't be such a bad idea, et cetera? And then I also set up a strategic science group. And the strategic science group was looking um, very, um, uh, with a very broad umbrella at questions like, um, how do we look at these cascading impacts of coupled systems all the way from plankton to humans? Um, what is the probability of a given event? Um, uh, and let me give you an example. Um, we know that there has been lots of oil that has been uh, dispersed into the water column. What's the probability of water that is uh, below the surface causing a red tide that might um, cause, uh, and that red tide could cause a crash of uh, ocean ecosystems that would cascade up into fisheries and cause a problem for, um, that would actually cause an economic disaster in the Gulf Coast region for 
um, crab fishermen for uh, various uh, fisheries. And which of the various fishing groups in the Gulf are the least resilient to um, collapse of various fisheries? If we think that's a possibility, what would be our first sign that that's happening? How would we know it's happening? What would be our early warning? And how could we get better scientific information to know if it's likely to happen? And that's what our strategic science group um, was looking at. Um, and then um, for the last um, 40 or, or so days, I have been uh, working at BP in Houston, leading a team of scientists that include people from the DOE labs, uh, from NASA, um, from uh, the Department of the Interior, and from a variety of um, oil field troubleshooting companies like Boots and Coots, Wildwell, and um, other groups that uh, you call in when everything's gone to hell in a handbasket and you need to get out of trouble fast. And um, these are groups that I have never seen um, people that can take an idea from a chalkboard and turn it into a real system on the seafloor uh, quite as quickly. But one thing I've learned from this group is uh, the importance of bringing in the scientific community. And one thing I did pretty early on in this uh, crisis was uh, in the middle of May, uh, along with John Holdren, the president's science advisor, was I held a meeting in um, Washington, D.C. We held it at, um, uh, at EPA, in which we invited the scientific community to come in and talk to us about what were the important science questions that needed to be addressed in this. Because everyone in Houston was so focused on killing the well and containing the oil that um, not enough, um, and uh, dealing with the impacts on the coast, not enough people were dealing with the science questions that needed to be um, solved so that we would understand where is the oil going, what is it doing, and what are its chronic impacts. So the purpose of this meeting of uh, leaders of academic institutions was to try to uh, plan out a science um, program. We invited representatives from BP to this meeting as well. And after the science community came forward with ideas for what were the important science questions that needed to be addressed, uh, BP was very forthcoming and put up half a billion dollars over 10 years to fund uh, such a research program um, that would be um, overseen by um, non-BP uh, representatives, leaders in the community, people like uh, Rita Caldwell under the auspices of a board set up by the National Academy of Sciences. And uh, they will be having a competition um, later on this month for an implementing organization that will be a consortium of academic institutions um, to actually uh, go out and solve some of these uh, science uh, questions that are very pressing. And uh, while the uh, trail is uh, still hot in the Gulf, to try to um, come to grips with um, these science questions, that while we sat in Houston, we said, we wish we knew the answer to these questions before we were applying dispersants in the deep sea, before we were applying massive quantities of dispersants in the surface, before we had to make these decisions in a crisis mode, why don't we know the answers to these questions now? So that if this ever happens again, we will have the scientific basis for decision making. Um, so uh, what's going on in uh, Houston right now is uh, something of an Apollo 13 type undertaking in terms of the science and engineering that's going on to try to bring this well under control. Um, the one thing um, I do see is that the uh, engineers from the industry, from these uh, uh, places like Boots and Coots and Wild Well, is they're very accustomed to uh, working with remotely operated vehicles um, where there is the constant connection to ships on the surface and connection to the human brain. 
One thing we do know is should a hurricane come through, um, there will have to be the, um, the capability to disconnect and um, leave uh, the containment system uh, unmanned with no ships in the area for days at a time. And um, the people from the oil industry were totally um, unprepared to know how to do that because everything they've done has been through remotely operated um, systems with tethers to surface platforms and surface vehicles. So at that point, um, I called in uh, people from who had ocean observatory experience, and um, engineers came in from uh, who had experience with um, OOI and helped them design systems that could be uh, installed underwater to help uh, this containment continue uh, through hurricanes when the ships would have to leave for periods of days at a time and then come and reconnect to their systems. So this is an example of uh, academia interacting with uh, the uh, ocean industry to help cross-fertilize. So um, to conclude, uh, I just want to say that um, looking back um, to what happened in the Santa Barbara oil spill, it was a tragedy, yes, but it was a wake-up call. And I think the state of California learned many lessons from it and um, changes were made to the relationship between the state of California and its ocean. Um, the tragedy that this oil spill is, I hope will be more than just a wake up call to the Gulf states and their relationship with their ocean. I hope it is something that our entire nation wakes up to in terms of our energy policy and our relationship to our ocean. I hope that this becomes a driving force for entire Gulf Coast restoration and a new energy policy that makes us appreciate our ocean for the nursery ground that it is and for the life-giving system it is and for the important um, economic driver that it is beyond just extracting uh, oil from beneath its uh, waters. And if that's what comes of this, maybe it will be something good in the end. Thank you all very much.